I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Professor Nick Colissimo, an accomplished strategist, engineer, technologist, and futurist. Nick's current role is as the head of strategy and integration, as well as the autonomy and robotics senior technologist and cluster lead at BAE Systems Air. He's also a visiting professor at Cranfield University, assigned to the Autonomous and Cyber Physical Systems Center. Nick has just completed a Master's of Science in Applied Artificial Intelligence at Cranfield University and has over 70 published, granted, and classified patents across a wide array of disciplines in the aerospace, energy, and computing sectors. He joins us today to discuss trends in artificial intelligence, as well as next generation computing architectures. So Nick, welcome, sir. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, we are discussing a paper that you've written entitled The Edge of Artificial Intelligence. This is, again, this is brilliant material. So I wanted to ask, let me start by asking what inspired you to start writing on the AI topic given that you have so many professional and personal interests and focus areas. Oh, thanks, Tim. It's a pleasure to, to be here and to talk to you. Uh, so I guess the first thing to say is, is the paper is, is unpublished. It's a few years old, but uh, it has been widely circulated. There are folks in USDOD, there are folks in MOD that have read it and, and liked it. And it's deliberately provocative, right? And I think we'll get into some of that provo uh, provocation during the, the, the conversation because I wanted to stimulate some, some thinking, some thought, and, uh, and perhaps a, a little bit of direction on the AI topic. Um, I guess inspiration. Right, so there are a number of sources of inspiration for me on this. Um, I guess, first of all, I'm driven from a defence perspective, right? So it's clear that the UK, the US, Australia, and all of their allies need to leverage artificial intelligence at scale in order to compete with our adversaries and future adversaries. And so we, we, we know that artificial intelligence can apply almost everywhere. It applies across the whole defence enterprise. Uh, there are transformative benefits from effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, and, you know, and it ranges from application in back office systems all the way through to logistics to frontline equipment such as crude platforms uh, uncrewed platforms like uxvs for instance uh, the processing of isr maintenance of support data and and so on and i guess the question for us in defense and one of the things that drives me is is how can we utilize the latest technologies including ai to improve our combat mass achieve force multiplier effects so make better use of, of what we have and I guess to make faster better decisions than our potential opponents so to get ahead of them in terms of the OODA loop the observe orient decide act loop in other words a little bit like a a, a boxer with um, uh, you know a, a kind of a thinking head-on but also faster hand speed as well than the than the, uh, the the than the opponents right and we've got to do all of that safely legally responsibly and of course ethically right so that's the that's the challenge so that's one of the motivations one of the drivers i guess the next one is uh, i've always been interested in information theory in complexity theory which i believe are absolutely fundamental to the nature of the uh, universe and you've probably read uh, some of my uh, slightly bizarre uh, physics posts uh, where i propose um, interesting theories i think about how we might be able to leverage that if it truly is the underpinning layer of the universe information uh, that is but that's probably a different interview um lastly uh, i'm sorry to kind of draw this out in terms of a lot of inspiration i guess um uh, i've been inspired over the years uh through the work of regis professor lee cronin who we'll talk about a little bit later at the university of glasgow he's the inventor of something called the computer which is a machine that can synthesize and synthesize and discover uh, molecules um, including uh, also nanoparticles and produce things like intelligent liquid matter right and 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 that is an experiment to witness because it's pretty amazing uh, stuff so I've worked with Lee in the past uh, a number of times as his industrial advisor on a couple of UK government uh, funded ac activities Lee's done work for DARPA as well in the past so um, so yeah so definitely an inspiration but we'll 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 come on to that shortly I guess. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, and again, this this work and these these concepts are absolutely brilliant. Let me back up, though, for just a second. At the beginning mm. of the paper, you started out with an estimate from DCDC's Global Strategic Trends that humans and machines will generate over 178 million exabytes of digitally mm. stored data by the year 2045. Right now, obviously, that's kind of a, a, a very rough estimate. It may end up being much more than that, could be a little bit less. But the question is whether today's approach to computing will be able to process it. I mean, when you when you talk about mountains of data that large, you know, uh, will we be able to retrieve data from it? Will we be able to do what we need to do to get information and work with mm. it effectively? What What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I guess, first of all, for the audience, um, an exabyte is a billion gigabytes. Right. So, you know, we're familiar with talking about gigabytes because, you know, it's the size of the hard drive or it's how much uh, memory and storage you might have on on the phone. But an exabyte is a billion gigabytes. We're talking about 178 million of those exabytes. Right. So it's it's a pretty big number. And, uh, you know, and and there's a lot of uh, data which is really useful, including some so what's and some conclusions which come from DCDC. Um, uh, who are the UK MOD's think tank, right? So lots of excellent work, lots of excellent papers, uh, which I do recommend to folks to to read, which are out there in the in the public uh, domain. So first thing to say, I think, is that we don't need to process all of that uh, data. Some of it we will do. We absolutely will need to to process it. But the rest of it, what remains, you could class as opportunity, opportunity to discover new insights create new capabilities and so on. So some of the data we must process and the remainder of it, if we don't process, is lost opportunity, right? Which can drive insights, which can help with efficiency and effectiveness across society. This is not just about um, our respective defense departments. Um, so uh, so I guess if if we need to, pro uh, to process a small amount of that, that data, then we're going to need to leverage artificial intelligence. And that includes machine learning as a, as a subset uh, within AI. And AI is a very uh, broad church, but there is a challenge, right? So if we look at the large artificial intelligence models, uh, such as some of the language models, some of the image classification models, then what we see is the demand for processing from those models is doubling every two to four months. So if you compare that with the general trend in processing hardware improvement, which is roughly governed by Moore's law, that's a doubling in, um, in, in processing power. Well, it's a doubling of transistors on, on, on chips, but it kind of equates to a doubling of processing power. That's not for every, not until every two years, right? So the, the hardware is, 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 is going up in capability. It's doubling every two years, but actually the, the demands from the large AI models, the sorts of models that we're going to use more extensively in the future is doubling every two to four months, right? So they're diverging, right? So that puts into question the whole sustainability of the approach on AI in terms of that hardware substrate, which does the number crunching uh, for the, the software that, that operates uh, on, on top of them. Um, and, you know, and there's, there's papers that have been written about this from uh, Open AI and uh, and elsewhere. And in fact, um, it was it was kind of explained probably the best in a page in a paper in Nature, which I think came out earlier this year by uh, Mahonic, Kenyon, and others, which was titled "Brain Inspired Computing Needs a Master Plan," and we definitely need that master plan. And I'll come on to some of the reasons why we. We need that, uh, I guess, during the interview. Yeah, yeah. Well, and just to give the audience a little bit of context, and I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with this, right? But, and again, this goes to these mountains of data. I mean, you've got, you, you have just more sensors collecting data. You've got higher visi video resolutions, right? And, you know, I mean, for instance, uh, you know, 1920 by 1080, when you go to 4K, you've got roughly four times as much data for every frame of the video, right? And so mm -hmm. we've got that. We also have this trend that you'd mentioned in the paper towards ubiquitous Internet of Things devices, as well as these super processing intensive tasks like cryptography, 
cryptocurrency. Then you've got stuff like speech recognition, video encoding. You know, I mean, on smartphones, video and video encoding is is just you know adding tons of data and processing, and that's all uh, you know on a person by person basis. This all goes into this massive pile of information, and like you said, we don't need to process all of it. But it is, you know, it just, it's, it's a load and it's getting larger and larger and larger. So, I, I mean, would it be fair to say that we're basically drowning in data mm. or soon will be? Mm. Well, so, so I'd probably use a, a different metaphor, right? So um, drowning implies that it's, that, it's, that it's harmful to us, you know, having too much data, but it's more a case of, of lost opportunity. So, uh, so the metaphor I'd use is that we've we've discovered a, a large island chain and we know there's buried treasure, you know, on those islands in the sands, right? But we're now getting overwhelmed in terms of where to look, how to start looking for it, what tools to use and so on, right? So we're scratching our heads thinking, we've just got too much to look at, right? But there is treasure out there and we'd like to find that uh, that that treasure so it's it's untapped potential if you will uh, and we but we need to tap into it uh, to stay competitive as nations and uh, as industry within nations and also in terms of our military forces that that keep us safe in all of this you know and so from uh, from a, a defense perspective you know we we know that a, a modern state-of-the-art combat aircraft will generate terabytes of data per mission that is only going to increase it's going to increase when we uh, we put uh, lidar, light field uh, sensors, hyperspectral images, and so on. And now per frame, well, we're not generating just a frame, but you know, in the hyperspectral imaging case, we're generating a whole stack, a hypercube, as it's referred to, of imagery. So things will will go up by orders of magnitude in terms of. Uh, that that amount of, of of data and and if we don't process it uh, as we collect it then well we've lost an opportunity um, but also we may lose the fight as a result because an adversary may well be processing that data and we may well be generating the insights and interventions that they need and ultimately actions uh, ahead of of what of what we can and uh, and that's a lot of data to 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 try and move around you know uh we we don't necessarily have the communications bandwidth to do that nor can we always be assured that our communication systems uh will be will be there and functional they could be denied we could be disadvantaged the terrain or the topology uh could be a problem and so on so moving vast amounts of data around is is never a particularly uh, good strategy and therefore that pushes us to a need to process things at the edge but you will I guess we'll talk about some of that uh, a little bit later yeah yeah well and you know so I, I think that we've set the stage in terms of data mm -hmm. now in terms of devices and again this is something you've written about extensively yeah so if if you were going to implement neuron like devices in silicon and scale that to like the 89 billion neurons of the human brain, it would represent cubic meters of volume, hundreds of kilowatts of power and many mm. tons of mass. Right. And you you contrasted that to the mere 20 watts and 1.2 liters of mm. volume in the human brain. So it, it sounds like we, we probably want to get away from these fundamental limits on how small we can make transistors and how many cores we can mm. use in parallel and start mm. to do something that's starting to biologically mimic the way our own brain is designed. I, I think that was kind of what you were saying in the paper, right? Yeah, I, I think so. And and I guess, you know, as, as I alluded just earlier, you know, we've got this divergence between Moore's law and the demand from the large AI models, which we expect to be using more extensively in the in the future so how do we square that that circle so as as good as the current technology is you know the uh, gpus and tpus if you will which are uh, being utilized for uh, things like artificial neural networks uh, or you know the heavy number crunching that comes with artificial intelligence they're pretty good right you know and and they've got a, a way to go and we can make uh, use of them but when we when we start to scale things up and you and you say well okay let's uh, what if we wanted to create something with the same sort of processing power 
as a as a human brain. The human brain, you know, 20 watts or or, or thereabouts in maybe 1.2 liters of, of 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 volume. If we were to scale that silicon, uh, the GPU and TPU approach to a level of equivalence, and we've done all the analysis and got all the charts on this sort of stuff, then we're looking at hundreds of kilowatts to megawatts of power and a volume of silicon that once you include the heat sinks and the cooling, et cetera, is about the size of a small building, right? Now, some people might argue that we, we don't need human level performance everywhere. We just might need it somewhere. Um, but I guess the, the challenge is that, well, even if you just took a tenth of that performance or even a hundredth of it, we're still into high numbers of, of kilowatts. We're still into you know, perhaps, uh, you know, hundreds of, of litres of volume and so on. And, and that isn't going to go into anyone's smartphone anytime soon or into a, a small uh, UAV that we want to be deliberately smart in order to conduct a surveillance mission, uh, for, for example, and perhaps do that covertly uh, and, and, and and not get shot out the out the, the, the sky. So, so I think the point here is that what we really need is very high performance per unit size, weight and power. So swap, as we call it, size, weight and power. right? And we, and we need that to process these vast amounts of data at the source, at the point of collection, because, you know, there, there's ultimately so much of it. Right. You know, so. You know, this is this is this is this is that part of the part of the challenge, right? That we're that we're dealing with. Um, so, I guess uh, what we're seeing is an emergence of of neuromorphic uh, processing uh, systems. There are silicon devices out there. So, IBM's True North uh, processor is an interesting one. It's basically a neural network on a chip, right? So, the software and the hardware is is effectively combined, you know, and it and it replicates roughly a biological neural uh, network and that approach is definitely going to going to help and IBM are, are certainly leading the way in this particular area but there are still scale and complexity limitations there are challenges and costs associated with manufacturing and semiconductor materials and even then we're still orders of magnitude away from a biological neural network in terms of its performance per uh, unit power consumption or per unit volume um, or unit mass, for instance. And so we're going to need some approaches that go beyond those silicon uh, neuromorphic devices. The neural processing unit, I think, is is what they're starting to be to be called. Yeah, well, and, and so the one that you covered in depth in this paper, and again, you, you mentioned Professor Lee Cronin a moment ago, and so you were talking about uh, basically an approach that uses nanowires, and it's a self-wiring system, right, mm -hmm. much like the human brain, right, the way that neurons seek out and, and you know, create connections, and so you, you've got something that's based on, on what Professor Cronin was called computing. Right, not computing, mm. but computing because it's chemical computing, and so mm. it seems like it is. It's very neuromorphic. It's it's basically trying to mirror biology, and and basically kind of create a neural network using these nanowires, the same way that neurons would do it in the brain. Right? C can you can you describe that approach to me a bit? Yeah, certainly. So, so I guess the first thing to say is that um, there are there are two parts to this. There's computing. And there's also the computer, right? So, so Lee is leveraging artificial intelligence in order to create intelligent chemistry of sorts, right? So, a, a new form of of intelligence, right? So that's that's one particular interesting angle of the research that he's doing. But his computer, uh, first of all, is a device that can take a data file and synthesize any molecules. So that can include drug molecules, you know, pharmaceuticals, uh, right the way through to synthesizing uh, nanoparticles. But it can also operate in a type of discovery mode where you describe to the machine what good looks like. So you say, well, I want a molecule that kind of looks a bit like this and it has these sorts of properties. Or maybe that's a nanoparticle, right? You know, a metal nanoparticle that I want in the shape of a pyramid or a bar, or a bar with a pyramid on the end, for instance, right? And then what the machine does is apply kind of evolutionary techniques through genetic algorithms 
and, and conducts a whole series of experiments. So this is kind of like a glorified 3D printer, but uh, you've got vats of, of base chemicals and what the machine is doing is performing a whole series of chemical steps, a little bit like you know the recipe for baking a cake, but it doesn't know what the recipe is. It knows that um, the, the operator wants a particular type of cake, um, but the machine is trying to find out how to make it, right? And it, so it's going on this evolutionary process on fast forward in order to work out, <clears throat> excuse me, the experiments which lead to the thing it is that the operator wants, right? And, and this has been successful in discovering new molecules and a range of things, right? And so, so that's the first thing to say. Now, in principle, that is a machine which can lay down uh, or grow, I should say, through an evolutionary process, grow a complex network of conducting wires, right? And those conducting wires could be metallic, they could be uh, conducting polymers, or they could be another type of, of polymer and not be conducting at all, but, but rather than send electrons through the system, you send phonons, you know, so packets of vibration, if you will, through the network. And there's lots of different ways of, 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 of achieving it. But uh, the idea there is that if you can create this random mesh of complexity that is that has a, a degree of plasticity, then what you can do is treat that as an untrained neural network and start training it. So the weights and the biases, the connections, the junctions, if you will, uh, within that system change over time to get the relationship that you're after, which is when I put in this input signal, I get this output signal. And that could be a picture of a cat and the output is, it's a cat or it's label A, which we know and we've assigned to being a cat as opposed to a dog, right? Um, and so, so in, in principle, what Lee is, uh, has been, been doing in his, his research is, is to try to break the idea that humans have to design everything. Rather, if you design the machine and the environment, the machine itself can come up with something which resembles a neural network, which we can then go on to train, right? So, uh, you know, and there's different ways of doing this, but uh, ultimately, you know, we, we, you know we, we talk about polymer neural gel brains and things like this. And so um, has all the potential to be quite a powerful uh, solution. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, and so I'm kind of combining a couple of the, the, the notes and questions that are written yeah, down. Yeah. You know, on, on the plus side, right, it sounds like this combines the speed of computing, traditional computing, with, you know, the, the complexity of a neural network. I, I've read that the human mind only computes around 200 operations per second, whereas, you know, I'm, I'm the, today's computers are in the gigahertz range. And so you can kind of marry the best of both worlds. Mm. One of the concerns though, being the devil's advocate for a moment, is that this mm. strategy seems like it might reintroduce some of the biological limitations that we currently struggle with. And, and what came to mind was, right now with artificial neural networks right like even the today's iphone mm. has a neural network in it mm. you can port those values from one neural net to another because they use the same hardware but mm. it seems like one of the potential challenges is with these nano wires since it's mechanically or physically wired it, you may not be able to recreate it right you might be locked into a specific mm. piece of hardware do you have any thoughts mm. on that yeah, so I guess the first thing is is that you know whilst the the cycle time of the human brain is 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 relatively uh, low, it is operating in a massively parallel sense, you know, and that goes for for all biological neural networks. You know, you've got a lot of neurons. So the the even the the, the honeybee with let's say nine hundred thousand uh, neurons available uh, to it is capable of such incredible things. You know, flight control, navigation guidance uh you know perceptual intelligence you know avoiding threats uh take off and landing you know communications and so on and and it does all that with in 900,000 neurons right in in a in a volume which is no more than maybe a grain of uh, a grain of sand or a couple of grains of sand and is probably consuming of the order uh, nanowatts or, or maybe even picowatts, right? So tremendously efficient, tremendously uh, uh, powerful, right? 
Um, so, so whilst the operations per second are, are, are perhaps pretty slow, there's a lot of things going on in in parallel. So that's probably the first word of of caution in in the in the comparisons, right? Um, the other thing is that you know the individual so biological neurons, so they're an electrochemical uh, system, right? You know, in terms of the connections through synapses and so on, and uh, you know, and, and so that does slow signal transmission down. When we're talking about nanowires here, uh, we can be in a purely electrical regime. So the, the, the signal propagation through the network can be very, very rapid mm. um, because we haven't got these chemical barriers uh, within within there. But I think your, your point about, you know, the, the ability to replicate or to repeat uh, and achieve the repeatability uh, in in these processes, like the 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 there was a, a paper in 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 Nature uh, on this, you know, it's a random nano wire networks and a winner takes all the emergence of a winner takes all strategy, where effectively, you know, there was just a, a big laydown of of metal wires, all random, overlapping, connecting, some not connecting, and 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 you know, and and so on, and you know, and and if if uh, Lee is successful in terms of uh, in terms of his work uh, in exploring some of these uh, some of these concepts, then you know the same thing will be a result. You know there, there won't necessarily be repeatability in in that sense. But just like biological uh, neural networks, you know whether um, you know so between humans, you know where you know our uh, the starting conditions for our brains is determined largely by genetics, right? And and so. So we've got this starting condition, but we we all learn and we train to conform and to solve particular tasks so that or even though all our brains are, uh, are different, we can still be certified to drive a car right, and licensed to drive a car. So in other words, we can still complete a, a particular task. Um, and so so we shouldn't get too hung up on the fact that physically, these things may be different, <clears throat> unique from one instantiation to another. Um, ideally, yeah, it'd be nice if they if they were, but we shouldn't get too hung up on it. It's it's about the outcomes, you know, and it's about the the ability to 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 qualify and uh, and to and to validate the outcomes as opposed to trying to do that with the network it's, itself. Because we already know that artificial neural networks, the large ones, you know, the deep learning neural networks, um, we don't really know what's going on inside them, right? So they're not particularly uh, interpretable or explainable. Um, so we already have a, 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 a V and V qualification and certification problem uh, with, with those. And, and so that pushes you to focus on the input output relationships, the outputs, whether the outputs are out of bounds. And then you put layers around that in order to um, engineer essentially a safe and effective system. So there are many routes uh, through this, but but it's, it's quite right to say that you know these things will will all be unique from uh, from instance to instance. Yeah, yeah, definitely unique, but also incredibly more powerful than today's machines. Mm. And I think that that's the advantage going back to the very beginning. That's the advantage to working with these massive amounts of aggregate data that we are producing and will mm. continue producing, right, in greater and greater amounts over the next century. Yeah. Nick, let me thank you so much for your time today. I, I can't thank you enough. It is truly an honor to have you here to speak about AI. I'd love to have you back in the future if you're open to it. We have many more topics that we could discuss. And uh, I, I guess I should close by asking, what do you see coming next for biologically analogous computing research? Mm. Well, so there's there's so much. There's so much we can still learn from uh, neuroscience and uh, and I'm fascinated by uh, Dr. Simon Stringer's work. So he works for um, a, a small British company called Applied AGI. Uh, and they're really onto some interesting things because what, what they're doing is, is creating a, a, a spiking neural network, which more closely resembles a biological neural network. And I think the, the beauty about the uh, that particular approach is just like biological neural networks, you've got these spiking or transient transient signals which pass through the network. And what that means is, is it opens up a whole new realm of complexity 
and capability of those networks because um, you know the signals are not just arriving uh, in in spatial terms at a at a particular n neuron site they're arriving in temporal terms as well so it's all about the timing so if the timings miss that means one thing if the timings are the same and there's constructive um interference if you will or, or at least a cumulative effect um from these signals that means another thing but imagine that on a vast scale of millions or, or billions of of neurons that's a whole new level of complexity which is just completely and utterly missed out of the the deep learning techniques the rate coded uh, network so uh, so absolutely i think that's a that's a major area but but you know there's as as well as appealing to biology i think we also need to appeal to physics or so quantum ai i think is is going to be one of the next big things that's a double points for the you know the double buzzword in the bingo if if you will but also optical computing as well you know so uh, so where you don't need to power the neural network because you've got a series of diffraction gratings that you're going to pass the signal through and the signal is light so in an image classifier sense you're presenting the network with the light from an image and that's all the power it needs to get to an output that this is a cat or it's a main battle tank or whatever it might actually be so there's no power involved in terms of the execution uh, of uh, of those those networks so it's absolutely fascinating time and there's many branches we can go off and i don't think it's going to be an either or case in all this but rather there's a lot more research that needs to be done uh, to to get to a position where we can do something about these vast islands of data and the buried treasure, if you will. Absolutely. Nick, thank you again, sir. You're very welcome, Tim. Thank you.